Excellent. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, my name is Timo Divaris. I'm a member of the BEHSR scientific group, and I'm here in the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, thank you for joining us for this uh, special webinar on um, preparing symposium proposals and abstracts for specifically for the 2024 um, meeting of the IADR. Uh, I want to recognize other members of our executive committee that are uh, present today and they will help us uh, in the webinar. Um, Miguel Simancas Palares, Roger Celeste, and uh, Noha Goma. Uh, and I see Dan McNeil, also our uh, previous president of the BHSR. So uh, feel our emails are here on the front page. So feel free anytime to get in touch with us for any questions regarding proposal preparation, submission, abstracts, and anything else that uh, maybe uh, we can help with. Um, the outline of today's presentation will begin uh, specifically, again, considering the 2024 meeting, apologize for the typo here, uh, and acknowledging again the tight uh, timelines for, um, for this meeting. Um, the session proposal submission deadline is September 27. Um, of course, you will have received emails that um, the scientific groups have to have received these proposals uh, two weeks earlier, but the actual submission deadline to IDR headquarters is coming up uh, on, this, uh, on the 27th of this month. And um, abstract submission closes uh, October 17th for the general program. So keep in mind these uh, timelines are, these deadlines are coming up. Come on. I, yes. I think you I think you stopped sharing your screen whenever we were testing earlier. So I think you're pointing out things on the PowerPoint then. Oh, so uh, this is not uh, shared. We're, yeah, we're not seeing your screen right now. <laughs> Apologies. Perfect. <laughs> Are now we, we see it. Perfect. Right? Yes. Awesome. Thanks. And I, I should have uh, asked. So, yeah. Thanks again for, for joining us. Uh, I mentioned um, our um, representation from BHSR, um, and we're uh, privileged uh, to be able to share this information with you on behalf of our group today. I mentioned that, uh, of course, we're a geared towards the 2024 meeting. Uh, so uh, the first thing we'll discuss are the timelines, the deadlines for these abstract and proposal submissions. Um, I will highlight that uh, proposals uh, are due to IADR September 27th, and abstract submission deadline is October 17th. So although it's uh, several weeks away, uh, these deadlines come up quickly. So uh, be aware of these upcoming deadlines. Um, we will discuss uh, an overview of how to go about preparing and submitting your proposals uh, and abstracts. We will devote more time on abstract preparation submission, but we will begin first with proposals simply because they are um, um, due first, let's say it this way. Uh, we will go over uh, resources that are available to you via IADR, uh, as well as other resources that are available as community guidelines and uh, checklists. Then um, we will spend probably most of our time discussing what may be key elements of abstracts um, and how essentially to build a story, how to tell a story in a scientifically robust way and also in a way that is attractive to readers and potential attendance um, for your presentation. And we will finish with some examples of a couple abstracts uh, where we're highlighting exactly uh, how these pieces come together. And um, at two different points, we will see if there's any discussion or questions that you may have. So let's begin with our upcoming 2024 uh, session of the IADR, ADOCR, and CADR. That's gonna take place in New Orleans uh, this March. We talked about the deadlines and I will invite you to visit the, um, the specific 2024 um, web page of the IADR in the deadline, in the, in the highlighted address below. That is, I will say, very, very informative. Uh, IADR headquarters, Courtney Skinner and others have done an excellent job uh, having all the information you need uh, in that web page. I will briefly highlight the, the difference uh, and the role of session proposals versus abstracts in the, in the big meeting. Um, session proposals typically lead to either symposia 
that are regular symposia or satellite symposia. And satellite symposia um, include what you probably know if you're in BHSR, our EpiForum. This is a whole day or half day event, so major things, or our regular symposia. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The other format of uh, event, scientific event you can have from a proposal is a hands-on workshop or a lunch learning session. So these four things, but the but the the bulk of proposals really lead to symposia as number one, and then hands-on workshops number two, and the other two are less less common. Abstracts lead to either a poster presentation or oral presentation. So these are the two individual type of uh, presentations you can have. Uh, posters are coming back actually in this meeting, um, which is I think a good thing. Um, and if you think about the, the numbers, depending on the size of the meeting, uh, where you have many thousand attendants, there are probably several dozens um, symposia in the final program. I suspect it may go over a uh, hundred, but I would say several dozens uh, for sure. And in terms of abstracts, you probably have several hundreds to thousands. Uh, depending again on the size of the meeting. We have larger meetings, smaller meetings, but uh, I think there would be several hundreds to probably thousands uh, in this upcoming meeting. In terms of duration, uh, a symposium or hands-on workshop will be uh, approximately 90 minutes long, and you'll have three to four speakers uh, in each for a symposium, for example. Whereas a poster presentation, uh, you have to be prepared for a one hour and 15 minutes duration of a session. Uh, where you simply have to be uh, near your poster. Um, these poster sessions are typically scheduled Thursday, Friday, or Saturday of the IVR meeting, so you can make your plans accordingly. Uh, and oral presentations uh, will be 10 minutes with five minutes available for discussion after each presentation. Um, and oral presentations are typically scheduled uh, on four days, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, during your submission, you can make sp special requests uh, if you want um, about scheduling and, and format. You can select your preferred uh, format. Uh, it doesn't, it's not always to honor the, the request, but you know, you can uh, add it in the comments. Um, I talked about the information that is available to you, and um, I would really um, emphasize the importance of going to this uh, specific web page. So there is the presentations sub-page within the general session meeting. And again, it's extremely informative. We will not go over this in great detail, but I will say that there is excellent uh, information available. I will go briefly over the requirements for symposia. We mentioned that symposia are typically around a cutting edge topic uh, and have about three to four speakers, about uh, an hour and a half minutes in length. And the key feature here is that you must um, uh, uh, obtain approval of at least one scientific group or network uh, to submit, to, to get your proposal accepted. And of course, more than one is highly encouraged. You want this to be of general relevance to more than one group and as many um, members uh, as possible. And of course, there are some other criteria that we'll mention a little bit more. For the hands-on workshop, uh, the key is that there should be a hands-on application. So that's what differentiated from a symposium. Again, everything else is similar. You want approval of a scientific group or network, and ideally more than one. So anything that shows cross-collaboration, wide interest helps, and also highlighting what's, what specific expertise is gonna be highlighted in the symposium or workshop generally helps. Lancer learning are, are also uh, uh, the, in this type, in this group of uh, presentations, and they're usually 60 minute informal discussions led by an expert on a topic that, you know, they, they, is of high interest to many, to many members. Again, approval from a scientific group or network is required. A satellite symposium is a little bit uh, bigger thing. Um, and this is a, a, an overall topic. For example, it could be oral epidemiology, as we do in the EPI forum. And typically, it's scheduled outside the official dates. That's why it's called satellite. So for example, the oral EPI forum is typically on Tuesday before the meeting begins. So for the submission, we will not go into this detail. Um, these elements exist in the written um, uh, guidelines uh, that IDR provides, 
but you know it, it should be a thorough description of um, the what is going to happen, what are the learning objectives, and um, these proposals should communicate why this is a session is of value to the members, and it's something that could not naturally emerge from an oral session, for example. It's intentionally put together to highlight something special and unique in many ways. Um, for detailed information, again, you can go to the um, presentations webpage of the uh, of the IDR meeting, and I will say that for the selection, which is I would say competitive, uh, right? So the annual session committee will receive uh, the applications, the proposals that scientific groups approve, uh, and individuals eventually submit. Uh, and these are typically judged by um, in order of scientific merit, impact. Uh, different aspects of diversity. For example, it's discouraged to have all speakers from the same institution. Uh, so you want to see diversity ideally of um, uh, regions in all aspects of diversity, essentially. Uh, and demonstrate cross collaboration uh, between two or more scientific groups. Again, this is preferred. Uh, but generally here, the one thing I would like to, to mention is that uh, because this is sponsored, we have to obtain sponsorship by a scientific group or network. Uh, my recommendation is to touch base with the symposium coordinator, uh, proposal coordinator or program chair of the main sponsoring group a little bit early in advance. So you can understand how they're looking at things and whether from their side they, they want to see some tweaks, something different and perhaps even get their help to create your proposal, because it's really creating program that should be, um, that carries the, the, the stamp of the scientific uh, group. So seeing it in a collaborative manner uh, generally helps, uh, but for that to happen, you need to reach out well in advance. And this year, um, as we um, discussed earlier, there's this requirement to reach out to scientific groups to obtain sponsorship at least two weeks before the actual uh, deadline. Here, I wanted to uh, pass the baton to Courtney Skinner, um, who will uh, help us go through the actual platform uh, of how to go about submitting proposals. And then we will move on to the abstract specifics for our presentation. So I see Courtney. Yes. Um, good morning. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. My name is Courtney Skinner. I'm the Director of Membership and Publications at the IADR AADOCR Global Headquarters. Um, you probably have seen my name in a number of places, and um, you will receive more emails from me if you decide that you're going to submit an abstract. Thank you for taking your time to be here. So I'm just going to, uh, can everybody see my screen? Where I'm, okay. So um, I'm here on the, uh, so when you log in, you'll see this page here. This is the welcome page. It gives you additional information about the session proposal and the abstract submission. If you're beginning a session proposal submission, you would click this tab here, session proposal. Um, and then you're going to create, click create a new proposal. Please be sure that you're reading all these instructions. I'm going through them pretty quickly, but they are there um, for your information. When you're here, you'll see um, some basic information about each of the session proposal types uh, that were just reviewed. And when you click here to say, oh, I want to submit a symposium, the page will refresh and you'll be given the required questions, um, which basically outline what is in the guidelines for session proposals for you to fill out. Things that are required have a red asterisk next to them. And as you move through the process, um, you will get green check marks here to make sure that everything is uh, all put together. And that is session proposals. And of course, if you decide that you no longer want to submit a symposium and you would like to submit a hands-on workshop, the page will refresh and you'll have a different set of questions based on the requirements for um, that particular session proposal. And you'll see here the sponsoring group and network needs to be indicated and communicated back to the IDR global headquarters. So that's just a very quick um, overview there. Were there any questions or would you like to, I can, Pass the baton back to you. Come on. Let's see if there are any questions. Uh, feel free to raise your hand or or put the question in the chat, perhaps, and we can we can take it from from there. 
I'm also um, including my email in the in the chat. Uh, so if you would like a PDF of this presentation, um, uh, we can send it to you directly. Thank you, Courtney. We will see if there are any questions as we as we move along. And uh, can you see my my screen? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So um, let's continue now with the abstracts. That is really the the main vehicle uh, of the uh, of the scientific program and what most people are really submitting. I like to think of abstracts uh, when creating an abstract in three different buckets, like wh where the where the effort is going when you think about putting an abstract together. The first one, uh, and it may be actually more challenging than what it seems initially, is formatting and adhering to conference guidelines. And what do I mean by that? Uh, it takes a lot of effort to do the research and you know get your results, do, you know crunch your numbers and have tables and figures. And then you have to fit it all in a 300 or less uh, word abstract. And uh, that can be challenging. Uh, I, I have colleagues and friends who will begin with a 500 word abstract that reads amazing, but uh, it, it's, it, it can be difficult to cut it down to 300, especially if you're very engaged with your research and uh, it, you're almost emotionally attached with some results or something you've written and you say, it's difficult to take this away. So here's where your friends and collaborators can be helpful because they're not as emotionally attached perhaps to the content. So they, they will cut uh, some, some material um, easier than, than the actual primary investigator. Uh, but what I'm trying to say essentially is that there's some art into bringing down uh, an, an abstract to 300 words. Uh, even more challenging, I will say, is uh, coming up with a 10 word title. Um, I can uh, share with you adventures where the hyphenation uh, feature has been overused. I don't know how many things you can hyphenate to, to get to the 10 word title, but anyhow, there's some art uh, to it as well. But of course, as Courtney um, uh, showed earlier for proposals, th there are some sections that must be there. Uh, and uh, I, I think the system nowadays will not let you uh, actually exceed the word limit. Uh, because it has an automatic word count as you're entering your um, your content. But again, uh, you don't want to be in a situation where you're at the deadline and you have a few hours to submit and you're you know 20 words over the limit and you're trying to cut something. So be mindful of the of these um, of these guidelines early on because it may take you more time than what you think. The second part where I think there is intellectual effort needing to be invested is probably the main part, right? Is a scientific component, the scientific aspects of your abstract. And here, what we mean by that is that the, the abstract should be a clear and honest representation of the science of the research that has taken place, right? So you want it to be transparent and you want it to be as much as reproducible as possible. Of course, we cannot ensure reproducibility from the abstract alone. But the main elements of you know why this study was done, when it was done, what it was done in terms of population characteristics, place, and all that, how it was done, methodologically speaking, and the implications of so what, these are fundamental elements that um, really are parts of the scientific uh, you know, chain of your project. Uh, there are also these reporting guidelines that I'm going to provide some examples of strobe guidelines, consort guidelines, and others where they include checklists that you can go through and make sure that your abstract is meeting again, is, is adhering to these reporting guidelines. Um, reporting and, and abstract writing, I will say it's more important than what we think on average because it's documentation. Um, if you're in the clinical domain, if you don't document something, your clinical notes, it's as if it didn't happen. Right? So it's important to document things at every aspect. And I will say in scientific research, documentation is what is really of paramount importance. It keeps the scientific uh, uh, record going and scientific integrity. So I would say take it seriously and, and, and again, give it time. Uh, I've also seen situations where uh, we devote a lot of time in doing the research, and then we have two days to come up with the abstract. And in some ways, we kind of shortchange 
the, 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 the presentation of, of the work uh, because the abstract is really what people see. Uh, imagine thousands of participants in an IDR meeting, the first thing that people will do is they will read the abstract and then maybe they'll decide to come to your presentation. So think about it because it's really the, the pinnacle of all your work comes to that abstract that will be reviewed, selected, placed in a session, compete for awards. So don't you know, give enough time to make sure that the scientific um, uh, outlook of your uh, work is the appropriate one uh, based on a very robust abstract. The third domain that again, conceptually, I think uh, needs some attention is the writing and effective communication aspect of an abstract. So here we're talking be, be, uh, beyond the science, right? So um, how you write things, the tone, the clarity, uh, of course, spelling and grammar is something that um, I would say is, again, is primary importance. Uh, nowadays with spell checkers and grammar checkers, it's relatively easy to um, avoid or correct uh, errors. But uh, again, it's it's a human bias, perhaps, where if you see spelling and grammar errors or a poorly written abstract, you, you may, uh, without wanting it even, you may um, perceive the actual research in a different way, right? Uh, because this is what you read, so you assume that you assume that perhaps a better written abstract um, may be a reflection of better research. It's not, of course, always the case, but uh, just keep that in mind. So uh, there is an element again of telling a story and effectively communicating uh, your work besides or beyond the, the scientific aspect. So again, there are resources that can help us with that uh, on the technical aspect, but also how to write uh, scientifically communicating in, in a more impactful way. So shorter sentences, more direct language, clear and ambiguous language, uh, avoidance of you know, too many acronyms that are not known, and generally conveying an interesting story uh, that you know, is attractive to the audience, but it's also balanced right, at the same time. So it's that fine line of being excited, you know, trying to be you know, uh, interesting and excite people and, and have them come to your presentation to learn more. Really, that's the, the main goal of the abstract is to say, this is what we're gonna be talking about, come to my poster or to the oral presentation to hear more and maybe answer some questions, have a discussion. Uh, but at the same time, it has to be also objective and, and, and balanced. So keep in mind these three things as you're planning your abstract, devote or plan to have enough time to do proper formatting and adhere to the conference guidelines, including mainly uh, word limits of the abstract and the title. Um, pay a lot of attention to the scientific reporting of how things are communicated, and you can use reporting guidelines for that. And I would also invite you to pay attention to the writing, the quality and the efficient, effective communication aspect of this, of this work. This is where collaborative research and having colleagues that can look at your work, uh, or if you're a student trainee, your advisor, uh, can be really helpful. So have uh, all your collaborators, of course, and perhaps other people uh, read it and give you suggestions. And again, the suggestions, uh, sometimes we may not agree with, but the point is that suggestions from colleagues and other individuals may be reflecting a part of your audience. So if somebody is not getting something that you write, you wrote, it's possible that some parts of the audience may also not get it. So uh, if, if even if you don't uh, fully agree with a comment, understand that it may be actually a comment that some of your audience will, will have. Um, we talked about specific guidelines uh, from the IDR. So for that, as for that uh, aspect, again, IDR and Courtney and her team have an excellent guide on how to prepare your abstract. So this is uh, available in the 2024 um, meeting website. So there are rules and guidelines. There are instructions on how to submit an abstract and the criteria for abstract acceptance. Uh, again, we will not go into this in detail. This is available, and I will invite you to go to this uh, web page and, and read this uh, through. In terms of the scientific reporting, uh, actually, the IBR guide has some information as well on the same web page. 
But I also want to draw your attention to other resources where you can find guidelines and guidance about how to report your research in a, a conference abstract. Uh, this is distinct from writing a scientific paper or giving a presentation. Uh, so on the left, we have an example uh, of peer-reviewed literature discussing how to write a good abstract for scientific uh, paper or conference presentation in our case. And on the right, there are two checklists. Um, one from Strobe. Um, there's of course one for, uh, from Consort for clinical trials that is linked above. And another one from Start for um, specifically for um, abstracts reporting research on diagnostic accuracy of different tests and methods. And these checklists are again checklists, so they have all these items. And the the way I frequently use those is for, first for education purposes, but secondly is you can just go through them and make sure keep them in mind. This mental checklist could be a physical checklist too. Um, to make sure that your abstract generally tells this story in a, in a comprehensive way. Um, I would say some things are, um, of course, applicable to a specific sub, uh, sub-study type, a like case control, for example. Uh, and you will find it sometimes hard to fit, um, in my experience, um, if you have a large human study, case control, uh, where you have to talk about the population, the sample, eligibility, exclusions, I see most items um, missing there frequently, for example, in a human case control study or even a cohort study. But uh, there are uh, efficient ways to, um, to do it. And having these checklists uh, is helpful uh, because uh, frequently we may over overcome or forget things simply because you've done the research, so everything is known to you. Uh, but the key is that not everything is known to your readers, to the audience. So the checklists are very helpful because they serve as reminders about things that are important for us to keep in mind. Uh, and the, the reader, the audience expects to see uh, so they can understand what was done, how, why, and what it means. Uh, another important part that I want to draw your attention um, is the uh, English language assistant program that IDR offers. This is a, an excellent uh, service that I'm very thankful that IDR has in place. Um, and it is essentially offering uh, English language assistance for individuals who are not um, native English speakers. And I'm one of those. Um, so uh, this is a two-step process. Um, there is one actually separate deadline, September 19, for individuals to e complete this online form and email uh, if they need to the uh, that address, elap at idr.org, uh, to have their abstract reviewed essentially twice, one uh, by a volunteer um, who is a native speaker about the language aspect of that, and then, of course, they have to submit it on the regular deadline in October uh, for the scientific aspect. So the ELAP doesn't um, replace the actual submission. Just be aware that uh, this is an extra opportunity, an extra service that is for, for free available to all members. And, um, you know, of course, uh, IDR membership is uh, extremely important in non-English speaking countries. Uh, so there's a very good service for, for that. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that uh, opportunity if, if you need to. Um, and the contact information is here. And of course, uh, there's a separate uh, web page on that, on the IDR website. And it is uh, part of the um, IDR abstract submission, call for abstracts uh, in that PDF. So uh, moving on to the key elements of an abstract. Uh, we have a list of um, six main things that we're going to um, talk about before moving on to how to tell that, that story. So the first thing that I think that uh, you will agree is that when you read an abstract, you will appreciate on a human level as a reader whether it's well written or not. Right. So the first impression is almost like meeting a person for the first time. If you hear them, if you see them, you form an impression very, very quickly. In, in the, you can make a, almost a judgment in the first seconds. 
So in the abstract, uh, this element is conveyed by how well this abstract is written. How well does it read? So here, this is where you want to have others uh, proofread it uh, and again, use all the spelling and syntax uh, checking that exists. I think that is uh, very important. So you want no typos, no errors, and you're going to be understandable. And generally, direct language and short sentences seem to be, uh, you know, I would say more effective than long sentences and in indirect uh, language. Now, I know there are there's some differences in different fields, but I think on average, short sentences in direct language seems to be easier to read and perhaps more um, easier uh, across, uh, across the world, let's say, on average. Then you actually want to use the abstract to tell people a story. So it has to have some logically progressing sequence. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the in the second section of this of this PowerPoint. But generally, you want to think about it logically. So frequently, I will begin by writing um, a check a, a bullet point um, outline of my abstract about how where I'm going to begin. And of course, the methods is you know how it happened. So it's just one bullet point, just extensive, and then what we found and what it means, the conclusions. So think about it as as you read through it that. It, it has to make logical sense and how you transition from one section to another, to another, to another. Uh, in some settings you have, uh, in some journals, you have actually unstructured abstracts. And in the unstructured abstract, sometimes you're actually more, um, uh, you, you have to actually tell the story uh, in, in a more logically progressing way because you don't have the breaks, the different sections. So if you have the, the sections, maybe the, the pressure is less, but still, I think as a reader, you want to have that logical flow between, between sections. The other thing that, again, it's a balancing act is to present enough information so that others understand what you did. So that includes um, descriptions of time, of place, of populations, of methods, of outcomes, of measures, of analytical approaches. Um, and you can even go into more details within each one, like what analytical approaches, how variables were selected, what criteria you used, how you interpret your results and, and all that. But again, it's a balancing act because you cannot have too much information. Uh, because if you do that, then you will not have room for other important aspects of the, um, of the abstract. Uh, for example, a method section frequently can take over the entire abstract. I can see how you can write a 200 word methods um, section uh, of an abstract. I think you don't have enough for, uh, for the other sections. But again, you have to balance, you know, what is the most important th thing or what's, what's really essential in each section. So, but the, the idea is that you have to have enough information so that others understand what you did. It's, it's really key. Now in, in the results, you really have to present the key findings and uh, frequently there will be many findings, right? You know, in a large study, you may have more than one finding or have secondary findings. Uh, but the, the idea here is that the, your, your results should match your objective and the scientific question. Um, I can tell you that I've read abstracts where the objective says one thing and then the result says a slightly different thing or, or it's, a different, it's, an, it's answering a different question almost which may be because this result was the most impressive, but then um, again, it has to match your objective, right? So the idea is that if you have even a, a negative finding or a null finding, uh, you know, that's reportable. It should be corresponding, you should be answering the question you asked in the objectives and of course the methods. The other thing's a little bit more nuanced and we can have some discussion of that uh, later uh, if we have time and we, we actually will try to do some um, breakout rooms at the very, very end if we have time. But uh, one thing that you'll see generally shifting a little bit in the biomedical literature is um, a move away from over-reliance on p-values and a little bit more emphasis on quantitative measures where you have, you are quantifying an effect and also you're reporting its precision. Or, or accuracy around it uh, versus deciding this is black or white versus on a p-value. Of course, if you're in an experimental world, if you're doing a randomized clinical trial or you're doing an experiment, a p-value is a useful decision-making tool. 
But for observational studies and, and human studies that try to estimate an effect and its precision, uh, this is where you'll see more shifting into quantitative measures uh, and uh, the, that we try to move away from over-reliance on p-values. That could be a, a topic on its own for a different webinar, but uh, just generally think about the, um, what methods are you conveying? Uh, a p-value alone will not even tell you in what direction is the effect, right? Just <laughs> probability that, you know, that your data are incompatible uh, with a null hypothesis. And it, that could be for many reasons. Um, so, but in, in some cases, you'll see that uh, these quantitative measures are frequently more important, more informative um, than, than a simple p-value. At the same time, you want to be interesting and exciting, but at the same time, objective and balanced. Again, this is some art uh, into writing this, but generally you want to, you know, um, if you're not excited about your research, then, you know, who will be, right? So you have to kind of convey, you know, your results, uh, again, in a balanced way, um, uh, while you're objective and, and true, of course, to your, uh, to your goals and, and your research. But uh, I think it's it is fine to, you know, uplift uh, the, the writing when, when appropriate. So the way to do it, of course, is to emphasize if you find something novel that's important to highlight, uh, and that may be your conclusion, or what are you adding to what we already know? It may be that you are confirming uh, previous evidence. It may be that your results disagree with what we already knew, or you're just adding to a mounting evidence base or something, right? So, or you may be the first one that examines something. All of these are, you know, can be highlighted. Uh, that makes it interesting. People will want to come to your poster or to your old presentation. And at the same time, you don't want to be overly conclusive um, if really there's more research needed. And I can tell you that rarely you will have done the last study on a topic. Right, like it's not like the literature ends with your abstract. There's probably more research that needs to be done. It may be very well that you know you did the last study on something and then now it's case closed. We're we're not gonna research it again. You proved it or you disproved it, and then it's the end, right? So maybe that's the case, but I can tell you in most cases, you know, it's not. So there's usually more research that needs to be done. Uh, additional, you know, uh, asking maybe the same question different populations or uh, asking the same question with better measures or more follow-up or you know, clinical versus self-reported or understanding whether there are biological connections in an observation, otherwise observational kind of story or cross-sectional story. So you know, there's probably more research that, uh, that, that can be done. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, if, if you just hit, you know, if you had a slam dunk situation, you know, say that as well, that not, nothing, wrong with, uh, nothing wrong with that. So here's the first part that I want to see if there are any questions on these um, main points that we can discuss before moving to, to the next uh, section on telling the story. So feel free to uh, raise your hand or unmute or uh, we can put the question in the chat. Okay, seeing, uh, seeing no question, uh, we will keep uh, mo moving. Okay, so in this part, what we wanted to talk about is really what are the elements of telling the story in your abstract? Uh, as I will discuss later, this is where you begin initially uh, and you try to build your scientific story and then you distill it down to an abstract. So perhaps one of one points one, two, and three that I will mention, maybe one sentence in your abstract. It doesn't mean that you know, these elements are not there, but you want to think about them because uh, including elements of all these 10, question, 10 points that I will make a mention of um, helps uh, really tell the story in a logical uh, way. So the first thing that obviously you want to highlight is what is the main problem? What are you studying? 
what is the main object, the, the main topic of study? And ideally, why is it a problem? Like, why should we care? Is, this is where in the old kind of, uh, and in some ways, you know, current criteria for NIH, we talk about the significance of the, of the problem. Now, of course, if you selected a topic to study, we have to agree it's significant and have to, to be studied. So it would be awkward to for that not to be significant, right? And if it's in the oral health domain and it's any oral health and disease condition, you know, that's a huge range in oral and craniofacial health research and behave, from behavioral sciences to epi and health services, like, you know, in BHSR, we include everything. And thinking of IDR, what's the spectrum of topics in IDR? It's immense. So all of these, there are significant problems. Um, they, are, they, they are studying significant problems. So, but it, it's not a bad idea to just mention, you know, why this is a significant problem. Like it may be an unmet need, right? It may be something that has human and economic costs. It may be something that um, is marked by increasing health disparities. It may be something else. It may be a new uh, phenomenon. So typically you want to begin from there, right? So it's almost like you're building a pyramid. You say, this is the problem. And then what you want to know if you have the space here in the introduction and say, what do we know about it? So the idea is that th there's no, you know, research is not built in a vacuum. So if you're building a pyramid, what you want to say is like, look, there's a big problem and there are things that we already know about it. Okay, so here it has to be very succinct. So we may know that, we may say that, well, dental care is in early childhood is a problem and there are behavioral, social, and biological factors associated with it. So we know that in general. Um, and that provides this basis for your reader to say, look, okay, I understand there is a departure point that you know, we are all together. We understand the problem in our current knowledge base. And then what you want is to build some tension. And that tension is, what do we not know? It's like you're sitting on this island and you're, you're trying to see across and there's something that you cannot see very well. But we have to make the case that, you know, this is important and you have to highlight what this is because it really defines that knowledge gap. So it may be that uh, it's a new material that hasn't been tested. It may be that it's a new risk factor that, you know, we don't know enough or uh, we're just trying to measure something for the first time in this population, right? But generally, you have to make the case that is a knowledge gap that we're trying to address. In some cases, it may not be an entirely unanswered question. Uh, like you may not be able to say, well, we don't know this. But what you may have, um, you, you may be in a situation where the evidence based is weak or lacking or incomplete or inconclusive. So this is a knowledge gap. And I can tell you that in most topics, there is probably room for adding evidence. Of course, you don't want to repeat the same study, exactly. But, you know, there, there's no uh, um, field of biomedicine where one study ended it in a way, right? You, 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 maybe there is, a, maybe you can, uh, uh, we can put it in the chat. But in most cases, you have multiple studies adding to the evidence base, and then all together they form a body of evidence that gets evaluated, and then you move on from that evidence base. So in most cases, you can make the case for what is the knowledge gap, but you have to be strategic, you have to think about it. What is your angle? Is that something I'm doing for the first time? Is that for the first time in a new population? Am I improving something? Let's say, you know, this has been studied, but this is the first time you are studying this with this new method that is more valid than other methods. So your angle is that here we're adding to the knowledge base by improving or on, on our diagnostic method, or we're using a, a validated instrument that before it hadn't been used, or this has been adapted, uh, or we're using methods now that are robust to, you know, you know, these biases, or it's the study design that for the first time we're using this study design that is uh, offers advantages over previous study designs. So there is some angle 
in most cases that you can um, offer where there is a knowledge gap that then supports your, your, your own objective. So the end of objectives is essentially almost a resolution to the tension you've built uh, all this time. Because you say it's an important problem and we know a lot, but we don't know this. Therefore, I will do this study and add, maybe not address fully the knowledge gap, but I will try to address it. I will move a step forward. So this, again, is difficult to fit in three sentences, but uh, if you think about it, you can probably come up with creative ways uh, to, to write it so this message is conveyed. And even if it's impossible to do in the abstract, at least in your presentation, oral presentation, poster presentation, you can be thinking about it this way. So you build that story that creates that tension and resolves it. And then uh, ideally the reader or, or the conference attendant is eager to hear your results, to hear how is this tension that you've built resolved in the results and then your conclusion. Uh, the how, of course, is, uh, I would say, a very extensive part. So number six uh, may actually take more, uh, more length, more room than one to five, because here you want all your methods. How did you do it, right? So here you want good descriptions of time, population, all the things that we talked about. What data did you use? What population, the time frame? What are your methods? Think about your research design, uh, and the fundamentals of that. Uh, and again, data analysis aspect, what methods you use, what criteria you used. Uh, there's recommendations to, um, to include elements of how do you address confounding. You don't see that a lot. Sometimes you see us writing and we are adjusting for important confounders, which I think is sufficient. You, you don't always have room to talk about your variable selection method in the our approach in the abstract, but if you can, uh, I would do that. Um, I would argue that's a very important thing, especially in observational studies. And then, of course, discuss your, uh, how did you make your inferences? So you did all this analysis. How did you make your inference? Was it on statistical testing with p-values? Did you use effect estimation? So a quantitative estimate and then um, your precision around it? Did you use something else? So you should be explicit on how did you make, again, your inference? Could be also a descriptive study, which is, uh, which is fine. Then of course the results, what did you find? Here again, you can be, um, you have to balance things and think what is really key, right? What do you want people to remember? We did this study and we found A and B and maybe C, okay? Here you have again to remember what did you ask on the front end? What was your objective? What are you trying to answer? And your results correspond with again, the, the that first section. So the main outcome, what did you find? And then if you have uh, space, additional supplemental secondary outcomes, stratified analysis or additional confirmatory sensitivity analysis are all desirable if you have uh, the space. And then of course you get to the, what does this mean? The so what, right? So here there's a high level interpretation of the results. We did this study uh, in this population and we found that this happens. Or if you can generalize besides that, that's also um, you know, desirable. If you can compare your results with what we already know or what others have found, that's also desirable. Basically place your results in the universe of other research on this topic. Where does this stand? Is it confirming? Is it contradicting? Is it entirely new? Or is it adding to what we already know? Either these are good uh, elements for your um, conclusions and discussion sections. Of course, uh, we hope the results are important uh, and you shouldn't be shy saying that these results are important. Uh, they may have policy implications. They may be surprising because you found a new association or you're improving on previous research or now you, you're implying that there's a new mechanism that things are operating in a completely new way. There's a new biological story that has to be told. Or you may illustrate that there's still a problem. Uh, perhaps the study didn't work as intended because the participants uh, that didn't answer the instrument. Uh, so you actually 
have maybe learned the lesson and others should learn it too, that um, there were these issues with this population, this instrument or this scientific approach. And in the future, we should do something different, right? So in any case, there are probably implications that go beyond your own study. And they are relevant to other investigators who are writing or they're, they're researching the same problem. And maybe they're important for people in the community. Maybe they're important for those in policy uh, or those who are uh, in foundations and they, uh, they want to direct funding uh, in certain areas. In either way, you have to think that the so what. Uh, we did the study and we learned. Basically, what did you learn? That's perhaps a different way to, to say it. And uh, frequently, um, I see, um, I would say, negative uh, studies being very informative because we learned something. And very frequently, th this result uh, will be as important or more important than a, perhaps a, a smaller positive study that may be less reliable. So don't, don't feel um, that the actual um, positivity of your results um, may, uh, may reduce the implications of your, of your research. Uh, very frequently, the, the, the studies are more important, more, more impactful than, than others. And then if you have that space again, and, and if it's appropriate for your study, um, a statement about what is next uh, is also frequently seen. Uh, in this type of uh, work. And here, in most cases, as I mentioned earlier, there's probably more research that can be, can be done. So what's the next step? It may be your own research. Uh, you're already thinking, the you may be doing already the next study and you are kind of diplomatically saying the next study should um, investigate this question in a larger sample size or with more follow-up or with a different method or with a different approach, right? So you actually may be doing it and you, you understand that this is important. Uh, others may need to replicate these results in external populations, in other populations than yours, in other contexts. Maybe you have a clinical sample, uh, a sample of patients, and you believe that uh, this question must be also uh, ans asked and answered in a non-clinical population, like say a group of people that um, uh, is not seeking care because you think that you know, a clinical sample may, may have this inherent bias of care seeking. Or you may think that you know, we have established an observational association between two outcomes, and now we need to do some biological research, uh, an animal model to, um, to actually study this question in, in, uh, in terms of mecha me the mechanistic aspects of that question. Uh, or maybe these results must be um, communicated to the public uh, or the clinician or the, you know, the profession, uh, or they should uh, inform um, guidelines of practice, right? So all of these things are next steps um, that, um, that can be done. For example, the, the, an interesting usual um, question that comes up is, well, we found this, so now it has to be implemented. But perhaps there is actually implementation type of research that needs to take place <laughs> because it doesn't mean that, you know, what we find is always implementable. So maybe you can say, um, next steps may be actually ways to understand how these results may be translated to the profession, to the community, and, and so on and so forth. So these are the, the, the 10 questions that typical that you want to answer uh, in, uh, in an abstract. So again, if you want to map them, the first five elements uh, are into the objectives section. Again, uh, as I mentioned, these may be just two or three sentences. Um, so it has to be very concise, but at least keep it in mind. You may not always have to say, explain why dental care is, is an important problem, right? Or why periodontal disease is an important problem. But again, you should try to convey what do we know, what we don't know, and mainly in the objectives, build that tension, the, that knowledge gap. Um, before you move on to actually saying what uh, what you did and how. Okay. The uh, part six frequently is pretty extensive. And I can tell you that in my approach, frequently I will begin writing the methods. Um, that, that helps me kind of set the stage uh, of what was done because um, th that's a very usually extensive section. Uh, and I, I try to make sure everything is there and it doesn't take over the entire abstract. 
and then reduce a property and then economically go back and fill the rest. But for a scientific meeting like IDR, the methods, in my opinion, that's kind of my personal opinion, uh, are really the, the driver of things. The results may be actually two sentences. Uh, and then, but the, the it's more important, in my opinion, to explain really well what you did and how you did it. Uh, because really that's what the peer review comes, comes in. You may have a, a long list of things that you found in the results, but if, if we don't have an adequate understanding of how it happened, then I cannot evaluate the results. Like even if the results are excellent, they're not supported by the method. So the method, in my opinion, takes more priority than the results. Uh, and I, as I said in the beginning, you may be emotionally attached to some results and you want to report everything that you did. Table six, the last row, there's something there that you feel very strongly, but that may be material for your oral presentation, for the poster, for the abstract. I would say the methods are should take some priority because you tell, you tell people what you did and how you did it. Uh, so they can evaluate um, how much weight the results uh, carry. So here I wanted also to take another pause and see if there are any questions because, before we um, uh, show you a couple examples of abstracts. And attendees are now able to unmute yourself if you have a question there or feel free to put it in the chat. I see Jonathan has a question. Yes, Jonathan. Hello. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the super insightful presentation. I'm a dual doc student at UIC and uh, it's been really awesome to learn a lot uh, as far as like a clear outline and strategy for building up abstracts. I had a question. Um, I'm fresh off of applying for an F30 and in uh, in grant writing, there's such a big emphasis on like justifying your methods and your approach. But and given the emphasis you talked about for the methods section, I was wondering, like, is there an element of justification needed or is this sort of taken at face value that we chose our methods for a reason and we don't really need to go in depth as far as the justification you know, or establishing rationale? Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's a, That's a great question. It's a great question. So uh, I think for, for a conference abstract, uh, if your methods, uh, one of your methods or your overall approach is what sets the study apart, you're using a new method that really makes the difference. You say, look, others have studied this using this protocol, or what we already know is based on observational data, let's say. And we uh, developed an experimental protocol or a new more suitable protocol to study this question then I think that's worth mentioning. And it may be actually part of the objectives or, or the beginning of methods that we developed a specialized protocol to do this, right? Because it's really a central piece that differentiates your study. If the methods are otherwise common or, or, or I would say what, what would be the, the common approach in the field, use established protocols, established methods, then I think you don't need to justify them. But I would see some, some merit and some value in mentioning that if really um, the, a, we have a new method or a specialized approach that really differentiates differentiate your study from, from others. That's how I would approach it. Thanks so much. Of course. Good luck with your research and the F30. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Any other questions before we move on? Okay, so seeing none, um, I have two examples of abstracts that I want to take you through those uh, and see and uh, highlight how we have been able to map these 10 points into two abstracts that uh, uh, some of our trainees uh, presented in 2022 and 2023. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, there is an IDR abstract archive. So if you Google IDR abstracts or IDR abstract archives, this will take you to a specific search page where you can search by name, by title, or by specific meeting. It's a very uh, quick process and um, you will find old abstracts. 
I found the first abstract I submitted was 2005 uh, in the IFDR meeting um, in Amsterdam, I think. So I was happy to go back and read it. And it didn't, didn't read very, very bad too. I was kind of happy to, to see that. I mean, there were many areas that I would write differently nowadays, but yeah, I was able to, to find it and kind of uh, reflect on it. So this is an abstract that um, was presented in the 2022 meeting that was hybrid. Actually, we were in Atlanta uh, at that time, but there were also hybrid presentations. And here, uh, I want to just go through the elements and see how we've mapped uh, these 10 elements into the actual writing of the abstract. So the title is Against the Current of Early Childhood Caries, Positive Outliers. So here, the problem is early childhood caries. And what we know is that it is influenced by numerous multi-level factors, including social behaviors, individual susceptibility, so biological things. So here, the, the, what, what is the problem uh, or what is the missing link is that we cannot really disentangle this intersection between social and biological influences and or behaviors. Here, we, there is no, um, uh, you know, you can, I guess, approach as a knowledge gap but what we're trying to add is to add to the knowledge base of these determinants, seeking to identify and describe characteristics of positive ECC outliers in a community-based study of preschool age children in North Carolina. So here you already have some elements of methods. So you can argue that perhaps the large community-based sample of preschool age children in North Carolina could be part of the, of the methods, right? So you, you could do that. Uh, in the methods, again, you see just one point how, but it takes most, uh, most uh, extent. Here you will read that the, about the population or the sample characteristics, where it took place, how many they were, how we define the outcome using ICDAS criteria, so very specific, and a quantitative index, what were the outcome measures, uh, what were the end analytical endpoints, uh, what statistical criteria we use for identifying people, uh, what by methods we used by variate, uh, and what statistical significance um, criteria, and so on. So, of course, here you can do more things, right? So this is not a perfect um, method section. You know, if I rewrite it or reread it, I will come up quickly with you know improvements. But uh, generally, you try to pre present a, a good picture of who was in, where it was done, how it was done, what did you measure, uh, how did you analyze things, uh, and how did you make uh, decisions? Then what did we find? So here you also appreciate that this is a very simple presentation, right? There were, how many did we find? There were 153 participants that met this criteria. Uh, and this was their main carries experience, the MFS, present a median and a range, right? In that case, median may be more representative than a mean, right? You know that the MFS is kind of skewed, and a range, which is, of course, uh, descriptive. Um, and here, there's an initial one results of statistical significance. Uh, here, we said we're using a, a statistical significance criterion. So here, we report the results, but not only the the, the p-value here we're saying it's 27% versus 18%. So immediately you understand that, okay, this is statistically significant. Is that important in my real life? Is that, I would say, clinically significant or public health? But is it really an important uh, difference in our human criterion, right? You can have a, a huge sample size and a small p-value, and you have a 1% difference in something. Maybe it's important. In more settings, though, it's probably not as important in something. So here we're presenting percentages. You can also present ratios. You present absolute differences, right? There's all this literature about what is more important to present. Absolute measures, relative uh, measures, differences, you know, uh, all, all these things. So you have to pick and choose what is more informative. Uh, in this study, we, we, dis we thought and we decided that the actual percentages of people meeting some criteria was very important, was very informative, it was simple. So here you can present a ratio of 27% versus 18% or 36 versus 20. So it's like 1.8, right? The, the ratio, uh, I think, yes. So I could tell you that the ratio of people with less than high school education was 1.2 in that between the low and the high participants, the outliers. But 
I don't know if the one point ratio of 1.2 or 80% increase tells you the whole story because it could be that it's going from uh, 2% to 3.6%. That's the same relative increase, right? So by presenting the actual numbers, you can appreciate both the magnitude of the difference, it's 20 versus 36, and also the, the, that relative change. Because in your mind, you can, you can do the calculation. And also, if you want to extrapolate in some other more quantitative method, you can actually take the difference of that. You can take the marginal <laughs> difference. So it's 16% more in terms of percentage points. You can treat it any way you want uh, for your application. Um, and the conclusions, again, they are descriptive. You know what we found and what it means. And then talking about future studies must go beyond what we've done and try to see if there are any mechanisms at play. And maybe you can do qualitative uh, studies to understand people's really experiences and life stories, or looking at their biology, because this is what we said in the beginning. They're, both of these may be contributing. So we say, well, if there is a connection between a positive outlier uh, in this and all these factors, we should you know, keep studying these factors specifically. So doing both qualitative and biological research. So this is one, one example that I think uh, well highlights this, uh, the correspondence of these factors and the, um, and the write-up of the abstract. And um, I haven't done the work count, count but uh, knowing how abstract uh, writing work, works, uh, I think that's probably exactly 300 words that we almost take pride in, <laughs> just not, not missing a single word. Uh, and, and the good news is that there is no um, over uh, hyphenation here. If you start seeing over hyphenation, you know that you know somebody struggled uh, in the pre-submission hours to to make to make the word limit. So I, I think this this looks good in terms of hyphenation. Here's another abstract uh, that is from again one of our other trainees presented it uh, this this year in Oregon in the ADOCR. So here, the title of that abstract is Developmental Defects of the Enamel GWAS in the Primary Dentition. And GWAS here, uh, you'll appreciate these are 10 words. It's not spelled out because there's not enough, not enough words, but it's a genome-wide association study. So you could argue that this should have been spelled because it's not a common term. Um, but again, I think there was no easy way to, to do it. So what you hope is that GWAS is defined somewhere uh, in the abstract. Uh, or it is just spelled out uh, fully. Here again, you'll begin with what is the problem and what do we not know, what we know and what we don't know. Um, so here the topic, of course, is developmental defects of the enamel. And we know that it's a heterogeneous group of clinically important uh, variations in enamel development. And that it, we don't know enough about them, especially in the primary dentition. So, so that's the angle. The primary dentition, you don't see them a lot because they become cavities very quickly, and then you don't know if it was a primary lesion or it was on the surface of a defect. Uh, it, it, they're just generally hard to study. And here we try to study the genetic basis of this, again, the community-based study of preschool age children. What would we do? Again, you'll appreciate that the methods take, I would say, almost half of the, of the abstract. Here you have to, again, say, what do you mean about um, uh, DDEs, so here it was diffuse opacities, uh, how genetic analysis was done, what array was used, how imputation was done, what software was used, uh, what was the final analytical sample, um, what uh, analysis was exactly done. So here the DDEs were actually transformed, used normalized residuals from zero inflated negative binomial regression. So that's a pretty important part if you're trying to replicate the analysis, right? Um, and then what variables were included in the modeling and how it was done. And finally, the criterion for deciding what markers, what SNPs are important. So it was a p-value criterion, uh, the conventional criterion adjusting for a million uh, comparisons. Uh, the results here are the, the following, that heritability was estimated to be this much, uh, and you have both the actual estimate and the p-value. Here you could have a, a 95% confidence interval. But in this case, seeing the p-value, that confidence interval is likely very tight. So in that case, you're more interested in you know, saying what is your estimation and what was the, the p-value? Because again, you're using kind of a decision-making uh, rule here, criterion, it's 10 to the minus five. Um, discussing you know, two different loci, two different uh, SNPs essentially, 
and their um, frequency, the p-value, and where they are. They are nearby this gene. Um, and what are the sign clinical uh, functional significance? There, uh, you know, we report those. And what does this mean? Um, well, it means that uh, the, the main thing, the highlighted part, is that there are two novel uh, loss, uh, two novel genetic areas with potential role in anomal formation of the primary dentition. And what needs to be done next? Well, there needs, there needs to be more study because these need to be mechanistically studied and proven that uh, if you actually go and change the, you know, the, the, the gene or, or knock out the gene, that you will see an actual uh, biological effect in, um, in, in a dental model. So here you may need a, uh, an animal model of some sort. So again, a, a different study. Um, this is a very different topic from the other one. But again, you can map the, the same elements uh, in this abstract um, and, uh, and see that correspondence. So uh, this is what we had uh, for today. Uh, I hope this was uh, informative. Um, given the, the time that we have and the, um, and the participation, let me uh, unshare. First of all, feel free to email us. We'll be very happy to, um, uh, to, uh, to answer questions and provide the, the slides. Uh, so feel free to email me and I'll send you the PDF. Uh, perhaps we can have an overall um, and a discussion session, and I see Courtney uh, raising her hand. Yes, Courtney. I just wanted to know if you wanted me to very quickly go over where to find the abstract submission uh, portion. Um, in Scholar One, I can do that very quickly. Absolutely. Um, okay, let me put my hand down too. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Again, go to screen two. All right. So I'm in the same place that I was in before for the session proposals, um, the Scholar One Abstracts platform. If you're going to submit an abstract submission, you're just going to click submission here. Uh, please be sure to read the information um, here. You're going to create a new submission, or if you've already started a submission, you can go and edit the draft. Um, you want to say, in order to continue through to the questions, you will wanna make sure that you agree to uh, the $25 abstract submission fee. Click continue, you'll continue with this type. And just like with the session proposals, you'll see the different steps that are required of you. And as you uh, go down, each page is gonna have instructions for what you're about to encounter on each of the pages. And again, everything that is required has a red asterisk. So on the first step is where you'll be entering your title and your objectives and methods, results, and conclusions. Um, you can enter tables here or images. Um, I would say that the tables are, is a little tricky to create them here. Uh, so if you do have a table, you can't upload them as an image. Um, and to the next step for properties, this is where you would um, put in your preferred presentation type, um, oral pre poster or no preference. As mentioned, you can enter your preference here, but the group program chair ultimately will be the person who will assign um, that presentation type. You'll determine which scientific group and network that you will be submitting to, um, and then you'll uh, submit your keywords. And then there are a variety of abstract-based awards that are offered by the scientific groups and networks by IADR and by AADOCR that are available here. Be sure to click the details and conditions to, to make sure that you're, if you're interested, there's more information here. Make sure that you are uh, qualified for it um, and apply. And some of them have additional questions that you have to answer or different uploads that you have to complete. There are a lot of them, see? Um, you'll indicate if you're a student um, and then there's uh, if there are any special scheduling requests you would like for the group program chair in the IEDR Global Headquarters to take into consideration. Um, indicate any type of financial support. Um, see if your research uh, fits in any of these tracks. Um, and then a one sentence summary, which also assists the group program chairs. And then ultimately, if your abstract is accepted, um, it, it can help uh, members and uh, delegates find your research easily. Here, you'll enter in all of your co-authors. As you see, as I'm clicking through this and I'm not really completing anything, you'll see that there's no green check mark. Um, so you can enter all of your co-authors here. You'll click this button here to make to to um, designate who is the presenter from the author list. Uh, individuals may only present 
one abstract. And then you'll complete disclosures here. And at the very end, you'll be, be given an opportunity to review everything you've submitted. Um, you'll see, and you'll see here, the system will tell you when things are not complete, but you'll have an opportunity to review everything that you've submitted. And you can go back to this, the individual steps if you see that you've made an error or you would like to make an edit before you complete the final submission um, of it, which would be there, there would be a button here at the bottom that would say continue and you will be redirected to complete the abstract submission fee um, process. And then you will get um, a notification when you're completely submitted. So that is just that portion of the abstract submission. Wonderful, thank you very much, Courtney. Uh, it's always helpful to go through the steps, although we've submitted a lot of abstracts, it's always very good to, uh, to be reminded. Um, so uh, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and or and or uh, put a question uh, in the chat. Uh, and while we're waiting, I'm going to ask my co-panelists, uh, Miguel Noch and Roger. I see Roger is unmuted to add from their side and experience what what they think is important to keep in mind for abstract preparation submission. They're all very experienced investigators, so please uh, feel free to add some words of wisdom and advice, uh, Roger and Tim. Yeah, well, first, thanks really a lot, Kimon, because it was wonderful. And uh, I'm going to spread all over to my students here and uh, staff because it's very helpful. Uh, my experience, uh, mostly based on reviewing abstracts, is that sometimes I was reading and say, gosh, this is so good abstract. It should be awarded something. And then I look, OK this guy could apply for an abstract because it's either a postdoc, uh, PhD student, um, or someone who fits into, I mean, for instance, uh, uh, the Luis Cohen Award is for people from low uh, and middle income countries. So we can cover a little bit of the traveling costs. Uh, and then I look, okay, this guy could apply because he's, he's eligible for something, but people, they don't apply sometimes because perhaps they're not aware. They are, of course, much more interested in getting the abstract done and uh, and then they don't care about how it's evaluated uh, so what i would say is check if you are eligible for any uh, award we have a, some of them and uh, we really would like to to give awards to very good abstracts uh, thank you kimon for this uh, great great presentation and and what Roger mentioned it's 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 very helpful too um, I just wanted to touch base on uh, two small things uh, that uh, may be useful at some point while we're preparing the abstracts and right before submission one of them uh, is just an idea to circulate your abstract or a draft or your of your abstract among co-authors usually you know we get into the idea and, and, and we do the best out of it, uh, but usually circulating it, uh, it may actually nurture a little bit the ideas or the points of view that you're trying to present with uh, with your abstracts as well. Uh, it's It's been really, personally, it's been really helpful uh, so many times and, and and I just get, you know, great feedback from, from co-authors. And the second, while writing, you know, sometimes we open the word processor and we're okay, what are we going to write? Uh, but usually what has helped a lot of times is to think about my audience. Okay, who is going to read this? Who is going to read it for evaluation to say yes or no in, in, in the research meeting? But more importantly, uh, who's the audience, who's the public who's going to read it once it's published? Because um, all abstracts from IIDR get published into the uh, supplemental materials from Journal of Dental Research. So as Kimon mentioned, they're going to be there. So who's your audience and, and how do you want people to perceive your message? So usually uh, uh, it's, a, it's an idea that has helped me a lot to while writing abstracts as well. But again, thank you. Thank you, Kimon, for this presentation. Great. So thank you very much, Kimon, for the presentation. Really, very comprehensive. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I will just, um, um, you know, touch on every, everything that everybody said. Um, from a reviewer's eye, it would um, uh, really be great, you know, when you're writing up your um, methods that they or your results that they map to the methods that you have used. 
Uh, the great thing about the IADR abstract submission is you don't have to write a lot in the introduction. You just need to tell us in the objective, what is it that you've, you've been looking at? What is your research question? Um, and it should be uh, measurable, again, linked to your methods. Uh, so make sure it all ties up very nicely um, so that uh, you, know, you get the best results. So yeah, that's all. Wonderful, thank you all. Um, any, anything else from anyone uh, in the group? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, put a question in the chat or a comment. Okay, so uh, seeing none, I uh, want to thank everybody again for uh, uh, signing up and, and logging on uh, to our webinar. Um, thanks also to those of you who will uh, see it uh, recorded. Um, I hope it's going to be a, a record um, year in terms of uh, submissions in the IDR meeting in terms of quantity and quality. And um, I also, as Roger mentioned, please don't forget the awards. IDR and the behavioral group and any other group offer so many awards, especially for trainees and individuals from low and middle income countries travel awards. So please look at those and uh, put your name in uh, because these awards are for a purpose. We need to award the, the best research. So um, we're uh, waiting for uh, your abstracts and best of luck uh, with that. And see you in New Orleans for those of you who are attending.